Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear myself. Thanks. Today we're going to talk about XTG desktop portals. Um, I must say this has been the most difficult presentation talk that I have ever made in my career, and it's only 20 minutes long. I don't know. Um, it's simultaneously the most exciting technology aspect that I've been dealing with over the past like 10 years or so. But it's also to some degree extremely boring. How do I make this look nice for people? I don't know. This can go very well or very badly. Let's see. <laughs> so let's talk about the world. We live in a place in a world where we are slowly shifting the Linux desktop to containerized applications. We are running stuff in containers. Executables are having less and less like access to system resources and might have good reasons for us to do that. Um, so you run applications, applications don't have access to sometimes to your files or to your hardware devices or to your location because they are in a constrained environment. This is how things are, this is where things are moving right now. So let's imagine for a second, um, actually, in this room, raise your hand if you know exactly what portals are to the code level. If you know roughly what portals are, raise your hand. Okay, it's uh, about 50-50. If you really don't know anything about portals, is there anyone don't, that doesn't even know about it? Okay, fantastic. Gonna mix and match um, here. So imagine for a second that you are an application. You're an app, you're an app, everyone here is a little app. And then the genesis of your life starts. You know, someone goes, I don't know, into GNOME shell and clicks on your icon. And then suddenly you exist. And all that you can see if you're running in a constrained environment, if you're running in a sandbox, is this. Nothing. <laughs> now we have a few options, right? Um, especially for old applications that have never like adapted to the changes of time. Um, if you want to make them work, sometimes, often, you want these apps to have access to your stuff. Like you want them to open a file, do something to that file, and then save that change. That's an example. You want to, I don't know, open your webcam and take a screenshot, a picture of yourself, or you want to stream something. And to, to stream, you need access to your camera, to your network, to your everything. So one approach to fix the nothingness, the void of your existence, is poking a hole into this little box that you're inside. So you go there with a, I don't know, a screw and punch a hole in there. So you start to see some things, not much. Uh, this is an average sized hole. But then, I don't know, you want access to USB devices. <gasps> That's a lot more complicated, isn't it? So you punch a larger hole in your sandbox. This one is bigger, gives you more information about the system that you're running into. Over time, you start adding more holes here and there, like access this folder. Um, I, wanna, I want this app to be able to access my cameras or everything that I have connected in this particular USB port or um, I don't know, my Wi-Fi connections and my passwords. You keep adding holes and holes to your little sandbox until you reach this point where even though you, as an app, you are inside a constrained environment, there are so many holes in this environment that you can take, you can imagine, you can form a pretty, pretty clear picture of the outside world. There are still like black regions in this picture. There's still some area in the box that you're inside, but you know, you punched too many holes. And now we have a problem because if you, not as an app, but as a user, don't want that app to have access to so many resources. 
Maybe you don't trust the app. Maybe you don't trust anyone. You live in a nihilist kind of, I don't trust anybody, I'm paranoid, I want to run away and hide in a forest type of environment. Man, this is really bad. You don't really want to do that. So let's take a step back. Let's go back to the emptiness, the void of the app's existence. Instead of punching holes and breaking the sandbox in fun and exciting ways, what if we give apps some buttons to push? So the app has to, instead of seeing what the outside world looks like, the app, um, the app just expresses its intention and something happens somewhere that abides to the app's intention. So the app says like, hey, I wanna, I wanna access your monitor. I wanna see what you're looking into. I don't know how many monitors you have. I don't have access to your monitors, but I wanna see your screen or give me an application window um, picture, something like that. Or maybe the app wants access to a folder. It doesn't matter how. The app doesn't know your file system. The app doesn't know which files and folders you have, but the app tells someone, hey, I want to open a file now. Give me a file, please. I don't care how, just give me a file. So in some sense, you have to break the sandbox without breaking the sandbox. You have to give resources without punching holes in the cardboard of your box. And that's where desktop portals in. Enter the, enter the chat, you know? <laughs> Essentially, you just teleport resources in and out of the sandbox without breaking the cardboard, uh, the walls of your room. A little parenthesis. Um, like, this sounds like a, an annoying complication, isn't it? Because now, you're, if you're a nap, you have to do a lot of more work. Like, you have to, you have to, not know what you're dealing with, you have to abide, like you have to live in darkness, essentially. Why, why would you do that? Why would an app do that? Why would you want to do that as a, I don't know, as a user or a developer? Sounds like a, an annoyance, right? I don't, I don't mean to give anyone an answer. I want, uh, I know that most, many, most, I don't know, maybe perhaps most people here might have an opinion on this subject. Uh, if you want to share your opinion later, just hit me out on the, on the hallway and I'll be happy to hear. But why, why, would any, why would anyone bother doing this? Unnecessary complication. Anyway, closing this. So where we are right now, we have the technology. It exists. It exists for the past seven years, more or less, as an independent project. And really, all there is to it is it, it is as boring as one could expect. It is just a set of debuzz interfaces for whatever that means. If you don't understand, don't, don't worry. It is not relevant. <laughs> we have currently, I think we are on the 27 portal count. We have 27 bits of information that we can teleport inside the sandbox without breaking any constraint. And portals, they have grown over time, over the past few years, like they have broken the technological barrier and in my opinion, they are, right now I think they are, I would say they are reaching the political barrier of the free desktop because encoding what a desktop, which buttons a desktop should have is a political decision, not only a technological one, because some desktops might, for example, want to expose, I don't know, um, window management functions. So they might want to expose, like they, want, they might want to tell, to give an app a button that says, move another window to another workspace but some other desktops don't even have the concept of workspace. How do we handle that? Because if an app requests 
something like that. And the host system, your computer, doesn't even have the concept of what this app is asking, how you're going to do that. That's where we reach the political territory, which is always tricky in free software communities, right? <laughs> Fortunately, things are growing in a healthy direction right now, I would say. Um, the technology itself exists. It's a bit annoying to use. Uh, lots of debus stuff to deal with. Um, but really, what I think is the most relevant is that for probably the first real time in what, 25 years? The desktop has an API. The desktop has common functionality that we can expose to apps in a completely agnostic way. Portals are separated from their implementations. So when you're running in a sandbox, when you're running your app inside a constrained environment, the XDG desktop portal service just offers a bunch of buttons for the app to push when it wants to do something. How the desktop is going to react to, this, um, to these actions is up to each desktop. Um, as far as I know, as far as is documented, there are eight backends. So we have the GTK, GNOME, KDE, WL Roots, XApp, um, it's a couple more, Pantheon, whatever, it's about eight documented ones, probably more. Uh, the self-assemblers of their own systems probably write like little Python scripts that implement specific portals in specific ways. I've seen, I've heard of these rumors. People like this in the community actually exist. I've never met them here. So this is a cryptoid information. Take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> but yeah, I'd consider this a successful number, the number of success. It's not only two desktops or the three main desktops or four main desktops. We have a plethora of people implementing common actions in the desktop environments. The portal um, project has been recently, like right now, it's, it's in a much better state than it was last month. And last month, it was in a better, better state than it was last year. Uh, we're slowly getting rid of issues. The ratio is pretty good. And merge requests are being merged faster than they're created. That's a good sign, too. We recently just had a release, uh, which marked the branching point where we started new features. Some exciting stuff that I'll be talking about uh, by the end of the talk, if I have time. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> We have a new website with um, fancy pixel art. If you're a geeky pixel art enjoyer, you can stare at this for hours like I've done. And we have in a light mode, and it changes the picture. Look at this. Of all the technological improvements that we've made to the desktop, this is probably the better one. <laughs> but yeah, back to portals. This is essentially what they are. They are just functions. Functions. That's basically what they are. So you want, I don't know, to create a screencast, you use the screencast portal, call a bunch of functions in that portal, and then you get magically a screencast without actually having access to monitors or raw frame buffers or kernel stuff or whatever. You want access to your location? You have that. Of course, not all of these portals are user visible. Uh, probably most of you won't even notice that some of these portals are being used, like the real-time portal, which doesn't have a UI. You just want something to run faster. It calls into a portal method, and it runs faster. That's basically that. all there is to it. And there's no better way to embarrass myself than trying to show you how it works, right? Let's try to do that now. There's some fun stuff to try and do here. Um, this is HPD, a fantastic test playground application for us to test new portals, for us to test existing portals, new features, etc. cetera. So um, I don't know, let's start with a camera one because I think people like cameras, right? So first of all, my notebook, it's connected here. It has actually, it has a camera. So this information is factually correct. Which is a great first step. 
for a portal, I think. We can ask for permission to turn on the camera. Without portals, without a constrained environment, this is probably impossible to implement meaningfully. This, you know, hey, actually, do you want to give this app access to your face? Uh, for the purposes of demonstration, let's give access to it. Here I am, hello. So, yes, cameras work. This is fantastic, right? Because I wouldn't be demoing this if it didn't work. <laughs> but actually, what is interesting about this whole thing is that now, if I come to, let's say, uh, let's come to apps, let's open HPD. You see that there's a camera rolling here? There's a permission system in place. It's one of the benefits of constraining the environment that applications run is that you can limit access and then you as a user can control what they're accessing. You control what information apps, apps have. It's, uh, for, the purposes of this, for the purposes of the demo, let's uh, turn this off and try again and see what happens. I hope it fails. It failed. <laughs> okay, so now we have a way to control who's accessing our camera. Isn't it fantastic? That was not easy before uh, the existence of these portals. Let's do another little experiment here. Uh, HPD, there we go. Let's um, why don't you create a screencast. Uh, let's do a simple one. Let's uh, grab a window. Let's allow windows, requests for windows and monitors. We've got this fancy dialog. HPD, the application is in a super constrained sandbox environment. It does not know which monitors you actually have, where they are, what they're doing, what their contents. But somehow, it, it is able to request for that information. Let's um, share a single window here. Let's uh, share HPD to HPD. It is very small here. But I hope you can see that it's working. I can, um, I don't know, resize it and the portal uh, notifies about size changes and it all works as you expect. This is a case for, um, where the design of portals chime in because the act of selecting a monitor is by itself the permission to access a monitor. Because if you don't want an app to get to have permission, you just cancel the whole operation. The same happens for files, for example. If an app wants to access your files, instead of showing the allow app to access files dialog, we show the actual file chooser, and you can cancel that operation. It's a part of the design philosophy of portals. So two quick experiments um, to show that we have a permission system, and it apparently works. And there's a design philosophy behind these things. So what comes next? What's the future of these portals? Currently, there's been ongoing work to enable USB devices. So applications within the sandbox, within a sandbox, they can request to access USB devices. Uh, this is a big one because it sets, it sets the game for other types of devices like game pads or, I don't know, um, head roll devices. Um, whatever the device sub subtypes of device you can imagine may come after proving that this concept works with the USB devices. Um, there's been some explorations on an extended reality portal. So applications can request access to, can request and own um, display device, DRM devices, so they can like show whatever fantastic XR environment in top frame rate you want. Um, there's been some research on peer-to-peer -peer portals as well, peer-to-peer -peer content sharing. So say you have, you're doing like live streams and you want to put an avatar on your face instead of showing your like direct face. And you want to send this avatar directly to OBS Studio. Right now you have to create a fake webcam device in the kernel with a kernel module so that you can hand OBS Studio a pretty picture. 
that great. Um, there's been some explorations in this front. People have been redoing the documentation of portals. Hopefully it's gonna be much easier to find, like how do I create a new portal? How do I propose this? How do I write the code for new portals? Who do I have to talk to? How do I have to, pro uh, what's the process and all those things. And also you as a user, how do I configure portals? How do I change my system to do slightly different things and things like that? Um, yeah, the permission system is also growing because right now it's just a simple, usually it's just a simple uh, yes and no, like I want to give access to this device or not. But sometimes it might be useful to have a little bit more granularity, like you have granted device access to this app six months ago. Probably it's a good idea to expire this now or any, I don't know, anything like that. And to have more like control over these permissions, better permissions, more granularity. Um, that said, I hope I have managed to excite you with Dbuzz interfaces. Um, please join us. We're doing fantastic work. There's been people uh, available doing code reviews and guiding each other. So the community is growing at this point. You can join us. Uh, this is the GitHub repository. This is the portals matrix room. Um, join us, we make some tea and uh, sometimes we make bread with olives and sometimes we make portals too. <laughs> so yeah, the future is bright. Um, I'm happy that I've been talking to you about this. It was the diff most difficult presentation that I've ever given. Um, unused assets, this is a beautiful portal. This is a beautiful wormhole portal. This is a beautiful portal too. And I've been made aware that there's a cat lover conspiracy going on in the community. So I'm not letting this go unnoticed. This is a beautiful doga. Let's end here. <laughs> Thank you. We have two minutes for questions. We have like three minutes for questions. I'm sure there's more than that. We can catch George's over lunch, but yeah, yeah raise your hand and I'll chase you down. So two quick questions. Uh, first, would it be possible to have the same portals applied for snaps? Uh, and um, also, uh, when you remove the permission for the webcam, it says failed. Why didn't it um, ask again for permission instead of failing? Um, first question, yes. Uh, actually, Snaps already use the same mechanism. They sandbox, I think, I'm not, I cannot say much because I'm, I don't really know, but the sandbox is created in a different way. But essentially, the filtering and the access to FCG portals um, behaves like you'd expect from, for example, Flatpaks or I think app images with a bunch of extra commands attached to it somehow. Um, for the second question, you have already given permission to the camera and removed it. So it assumes that you don't want that app to have permission. So the camera, uh, the camera portal doesn't really like doesn't ask again because then apps can just keep asking for cameras every single time. There is a way to remove the permission because it's a tri-state, it's not a dual state. So the first state is unset, which is when we ask. Second state is either yes or no. And that's a final decision encoded in the permission. Of course, it's open to like more investigations on how to improve this user experience. Um, we don't have great messages, great rejection modes, um, great um, failure modes for these things. Is there a way to have like a permission set like only once, like in Android, where you can set the permission like just this one time, and then when you open the app like next time, it doesn't have the permission again? Yeah, that that would be a portal policy. So I would say like one of the new innovations that we have in portals is that we have a Config way to config which portals are used for, for which backends are used for these things. So on the GNOME side, I don't think there's been any research on allowing everything or any kind of experience like this. But you can implement something like that 
Um, you can write a Python script that just says yes to every single access request or no to every single access request without even showing you a UI. So if you want to self-assemble something and do some like experimentation and show us off, you can, you can do that. And it will be actually highly appreciated. Uh, one question here. Um, I'm an application developer um, that's not using big toolkits like Qt or GDK um, because of targeting audio plugins. We don't want to use these big frameworks there. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is there a C-level API that you can expose for all these deep bus complexities? Because having to implement this already in two different places is... Uh, it's very painful. I know. <laughs> so if it, there's a way to have an official, or even if it's not official, someone making an API that I can use as a C developer. LibPortal. That will be very welcome, yes. <laughs> yes. It is a nicer, much, much nicer API to handle this. Hi. I, I think I missed something from the beginning in the sense that you, you started talking about confined application, but I didn't really get what the, what's the mechanism to confine the application to begin with, the sandboxing. Because otherwise this sounds mostly like it's opt-in, an application will opt-in to be confined and then use the portals. What's actually preventing an application from just using a, a C uh, function like open and just open a file without using the debuff methods? So um, this enters an area where I cannot explain every single technology to you. I know about Flatpaks, I don't know about Snaps, I don't know about App Armor or uh, any other types of confinement of non-sandbox um, applications. At least on Flatpak, we use uh, user namespaces. Um, the mechanism is called bubble wrap. So the app is mounted in a user namespace. It is isolated um, from everything. And then, in the manifest file, when you when you in the file that you use to build your container application, you can set some you know you can set some holes in the sandbox if you want. That's not what I want people to be doing. The goal here is to have zero holes and everything happens through portals. Um, but yeah, at least on the flatpak side of things, we use bubble wrap and that um, isolates the process namespace um, and file system and etc like this at the kernel level I suppose all right we only have two and a half minutes before Fairphone is on stage but let's give George's one more applause thank you thank you